We have gathered here on this All Hallows Eve to be part of a service of love and remembrance for Margo Adler. We gather to make peace with the spirit of life and with ourselves as we acknowledge this death that has come to pass. In the ancient book of Ecclesiastes, we read, For everything there is a season, and a time to every man under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak. For everything there is a season, and a time to every matter under heaven. For Margo, July 28 was a time to die. For us, this day is a time to mourn, perhaps a time to weep. We are here because we loved Margo, or because we care deeply about those who loved her and knew her well. Something unique in our lives is now missing. A candle of the Spirit has gone from us, and we here are poorer by the loss of a life whose place in our hearts was secure. We know that wise people come to accept the death of those they love. Wise people also recognize that death will sometime, maybe sooner, maybe later, come to us as well. But in these moments, we find it hard to imagine this extraordinary, vital life put away. And neither our words nor Margot's uncharacteristic silence will reconcile us soon to it. Margot had been a member of this congregation for more than two decades. Make no mistake, you wouldn't often find her here on a Sunday morning. <laughs> but she considered this sanctuary for seekers a spiritual home, a prophetic voice of hope in a fractured world, and a source of strength in times of personal and national trouble. Margot filled the pulpit here from time to time. Most recently, two years ago, when she preached on why we love vampires. She was pleased about preaching here, especially about vampires, <laughs> as you can see in the photo on the back of your program. I was pleased as well. The vampire sermon emerged from one of our many conversations over morning coffee. Margot one day told me about all the books she had read about vampires during her husband John's illness. She wondered why vampires fascinated us so. I responded, well, I don't know either, but it sounds like a sermon you should preach at All Souls. <laughs> and so she did. When John died, Margot wanted his service to be here, which it was. And she wanted her service, at least one of them, to be here as well. I'm honored to be part of it. I miss Margot enormously. I love Margot, as did each of us in our own way, which is why we are here. So be it. Let this hour be love's hour, and these simple rites love's confession. For it is love's tribute we come here to offer to Margo and to each other. The song in Gaelic from the Highlands of Scotland speaks of coming home to beauty and being welcomed by our ancestors. <laughs>
and then later I thought, Marco rescued me from the bottom of the slide. That during my first year at City and Country in a time of great emotional turmoil for myself and my family, she saw my isolation as my first year there. And how I would sit at the bottom of the slide to provoke kids into crashing into me so I could start a fight. <laughs> and she decided instead of fighting, she would find out who I was, get to know me. In the same way, I would say that Marga would always approach the world, get to know it, to make all of it a friend, a place of inquiry, of knowledge, of joy. So that by the end of that year, I would say to myself, if you have one friend, it's enough. Because by then, I had received that gift from her, that giftness of inquiry and openness to the world. And that's how she became my best friend, the one I would become blood sisters with on the rocks below Belvedere Castle, the one with whom I shared most, most the physical and the fantasy play of childhood. When mostly, we were Amazons and goddesses. Artemis and Athena, mostly. Never <laughs> Aphrodite. <laughs> Never beauty, always action, the active principle, hunting down, gaining wisdom, doing battle. As we played on the ginkgo tree in my backyard, in her park, and in her building. So that I can feel it even now, and I believe she's written in this, how in her play, that instrumentality and reasoned on inquiry came to be part two of an intense spirituality which would distinguish her, that she could already feel the goddess energy inside herself. And so, I'm back to the slide. How in her building, the elevator was in a shaft, and you, many of you will remember these before your fire laws. Um, with the staircase in a shaft surrounded by metal mesh, with the staircase spiraling around the elevator shaft, and how there were windows between the stories, not at the stories, but between them, so that the stairs passed in front of the window. And we discovered that we could slip into the window casement. It was about six inches wide, right? So we'd get into the window casement behind the stairs, and we could slide from floor to floor all the way down from our 11th story <laughs> down to the first. Ooh. Okay. So, as I thought about that, without using the stairs, and of course, the elevator, and the elevator man who might catch us, would be the monster we were avoiding, or the evildoer we were doing battle with, as we laughed it and fought it in our own world of snakes and ladders. Our laughter, Marco's brilliant laughter, echoing in the hollow of the shaft between the stories. So that I want to remember her like that. That image, that spirit, playing still, down the slab slide, up the stairs, snakes and ladders, laughter echoing so we can hear it in the in-between spaces the interstitial textures of the universe. With us always, as some of us later would say in Spanish, compañera Marco Adler, presente, ahora y siempre. Here with us, always and forever, Marco Adler. Thank you. Um, I'm Mary Kim Bluestein. I'm also a classmate of Marco's from City and Country. Uh, but Sarah is absolutely right. Um, she was our choice to represent our school because her friendship with Marco was palpable and um, touching to all of us. So, uh, but the reason I'm talking to you is because not only did I know Marco through City and Country, but um, Alex wanted me to tell you a little bit about Margot's other great place that she loved, which was Martha's Vineyard, um, where I lived part time and where Margot spent many summers. Um, 
I'm going to read to you. I'm afraid it's not going to be as exciting as Sarah's presentation. Um, but I want to get it right. Margo went to the vineyard every summer as a child. And after a pause, she resumed going each summer with her husband John and son Alex. She particularly loved the remote up-island town of Chilmark and its little fishing village, Manemsha. She knew its paths and trails intimately. She especially loved swimming at the beaches. Going back to that island each summer helped her rebalance her life and reground herself. Chilmark in the 1950s was Margot's Garden of Eden. The vineyard then, in the 50s, was very different from what it is today. It was rural, sleepy, safe, sort of a hip neighbory. No trespassing signs were unheard of. No one locked up anything. Margot and her parents, Kurt and Freda, would drive up from New York City to stay in a simple little Chilmark cottage, equipped with only the most rudimentary amenities. Margo would take off her shoes in the car on the way up, and it was a point of pride not to put them back on until she returned to the city two months later. With her summer pals, Margo enjoyed a degree of freedom unimaginable today. Adults were largely absent from the kids' daily lives. The parents set up tabs for them at the little general store and the gas station, which happened to stock a world-class array of candy. The kids were on their own all day, wandering about, playing with whoever they felt like, walking along the roads or hitchhiking wherever they wanted to go. They picked wildflowers and berries, created hideouts and imaginary worlds in the dunes and woods. There were Tuesday night sing-alongs and Friday night square dances at the informal community center that Freda herself helped to set up. Because she was a good and confident dancer, Margo was a popular partner. There were empty shacks scattered around the island, and the kids took them over as clubhouses. One summer, Margo lived in a little cottage called the Bit and Spur, very important, next to a converted windmill in which her friend Kathleen lived. Close by, the girls discovered an old red barn full of antique furniture. They made it their own. They arranged the furniture to their liking, created rituals and traditions, and considered it theirs for the rest of the summer. No adult ever noticed. One summer, Margaret's parents rented a little weather-beaten clever cottage perched above Menemsha Harbor. This put Margot in the center of the action, such as it was. She could saunter on little grassy paths to the ice cream shack, the general store, or the gas station. She could wander to the sheltered corner behind the rocky jetty where little kids went crabbing, or to Menemsha Beach. It was in that little cottage that Margo's parents broke the news to her that they were getting divorced. They never returned to the vineyard. It was Margo's last childhood summer there, and in a sense, the end of a blissful and carefree innocence. Her parents' divorce was a grievous blow, and so was the loss of the vineyard. She was cast out of the garden. But years later, Margo returned to the vineyard with John. They rented a little cottage from her old friend Kathleen with no heat or indoor shower. And because they were both writing books at that point, they stayed in it till November. They brought their books with them and a telescope. This became their summer ritual, though later it was confined to a precious two or three weeks each summer. When Alex arrived, he happily settled into the routine, eventually calling his own stock of Harry Potter books. Margo never drove. She happily and energetically walked everywhere, and not with earbuds in. We all know she was intensely thinking on those walks, even as she drank in the details of the scene around her. And she didn't just walk on the roads. She meandered through the woods and down what are called on the vineyard ancient ways. Paths that have been used since the 17th and 18th centuries, regardless of the private property restrictions that have come into place. 
Some mornings I would wake up to discover Margo sitting on my porch, binoculars around her neck, having roamed around in the woods bird watching for several hours at dawn, and ready for coffee and a chat on what she'd been turning over in her mind. Margo adored swimming in the ocean, and her favorite place to do it was Lucy Vincent Beach, our town beach. A freshwater pond borders it, and the red clay cliffs hold shards from centuries ago when the Wampanoag tribe lived there. Barn swallows nest in the cliffs, and beach plum, dusty miller, and wild grasses line the dunes. You can see down the beach for miles. On the beach, Margo would join a particular circle of friends. One of them wrote this description of Margo's role in their circle. Margo's arrival on the vineyard was a big deal. Rumors of the likely day floated among the beach crowd for days, until one of us would see her trudging happily along the side of the road. We'd stop, roll down the window to say hello and offer a ride, and she would boom back a hearty hello and say, oh no, she was loving walking the roads of Chilmark again. Later that day, or the next, one of us would call out that she was walking down the beach toward us at the spot we always gathered. Again, she'd be smiling broadly and walking with a sense of purpose and urgency. Often, she would just plop down very near or on top of whoever was sitting closest to her arrival, let out a hearty sigh of pleasure, and say, anyone going in the water? Margo loved swimming the ocean. She entered smiling and exited smiling. In, bet in between, she was notorious for her lack of navigational abilities as she swam or body surfed. A Margot collision was something most experienced on more than one occasion. When Margot took part in conversation, it was truly full engagement, nothing casual about it. To some, it occasionally felt that Margot was self-centered and indifferent to them. But that wasn't really what was going on. It was as if all those long days of trying to get and report the story, to understand what was really going on in the world and report it concisely, had left her with a head full of the rest of the story, the background, the connections to the larger world, and she could not contain her desire to share it. That's the end of his statement. It was on Lucy Vincent Beach that Alex scattered Margot's ashes. Kathleen and I were with him. Margot would have liked that we broke the rules by sneaking onto the beach before it opened, very early in the morning. We had it to ourselves. It was a clear, tranquil day with little breeze. The air was fresh. The roller sounded steady and gentle. The sand gleamed near the shore, and behind us the red cliffs were already warm in the sun. Alex scattered some of Margo's ashes around the base of the cliffs and on the path toward the inland pond where Margo sometimes swam. He scattered most of them in the ocean waves themselves, though, and we thought of it as Margo's rollicking swim that will go on and on. Thank you. Singer, birder, swimmer, community gardener, walker. Margo was all those things. She loved falconry, Greek mythology, Star Trek, Twilight, Jean-Luc Picard, <laughs> Hunger Games, Vampires, Theater, and Harry Potter, Galaxy Quest, Babette's Feast, Buttercream Icing, Lobster, Marzipan, Peanut Butter, and Chocolate. Margo would make lovely yum yum noises around food. <laughs> During the recent barbecue event at the NPR office here in New York, while Stephanie Walters was setting up the barbecue, we could almost hear Margo come in opening the lids to dishes, <laughs> anticipating good things. Ooh, yum, 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 oh. mm. She was one of the smartest people I have ever met. Everything, history, current affairs, all connected. Pow! So 
smart and so very Margot. Before I met Margot, I'd never heard the phrase, oh, but, oh, oh, I'm sorry, man, Martians took over my brain. <laughs> she lost her house keys for more than any five people you'll know. But she did remember the most wonderful things, though. Once at work, we were all sitting around and talking, and it must have been close to the holidays, because we were talking about those things, those toys we really wanted as little kids, but we never got. Well, on my birthday that year, after decades, thanks to Margo, I finally got my little scientist chemistry set. <laughs> and it was really fun. <laughs> And it proved her right. It's never too late to have a happy childhood. <laughs> From Margo, I learned that no one is just one thing. Not the people you don't like. Not just the politicians with atrocious agendas. But also the people we do like, admire even. Not just one thing. Not defined by one aspect by one action. We are more. And if that action was a particularly heroic one, we could be less than that one thing. But we are still more. She forgave us our frailties, our faults, and was very comfortable. She had hers. She was so very earthy. Sometimes Marco's middle name was not Susanna, but T-M-I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on a trip to Northern California to Esalen, where she was giving workshops, she was relaxing in the hot springs there at the top of the beautiful cliffs. You could hear seals barking down in the surf through the sunshine, the glorious Pacific. The greenery, wildflowers, roseberries, the smell of the sea air, the blossoms and the herbs, and the sulfur scent of the glorious natural hot springs under the blue, blue sky. Isn't this fantastic, she said. You could fart and no one would know. <laughs> Margo and my husband, Piero, were newly arrived in Cambridge, Massachusetts as Neiman Fellows at Harvard. Together with her partner, later her husband, John Weidman, we hit it off immediately and became inseparable friends. The four of us could often be found at a cheap seafood restaurant, passionately discussing physics, outer space, spirituality, Marxism, fascism, food, wine, movies, just about anything. During that year in Cambridge, Margo became the unofficial of the class of 1982. One of the most memorable events was when she led the entire group, some 20 of, them, 20 of us, on a day-long visit to her beloved Martha's Vineyard. She shared with us her love, her knowledge of the history and lore of every corner of that island. But it was when Marco addressed the rest of the Neiman Fellows in what was known as the soundings with which the Fellows introduced themselves to each other that I began to discover Marco Adler, the radio reporter. Marco brought with her selections for tapes and played clips of some of her NPR reports for us. It was through, through Marco that I discovered NPR. The network did not exist when I had left the States after college, and I would never heard news stories reported that way, or as she referred to herself by Marco, the anthropological journalist. Mm. Margo and I were born one month apart, and as members of the first year of the baby room, we shared a common legacy of pop culture, the coming of age experiences of the 60s, civil rights battles, and political turbulence on campus. But as far as sex, drugs, and rock and roll, we found that for both of us it was mostly music. <laughs> Margo was a red diaper baby, while mine was a shaker pale of pink. But we had one political background in common. Her father and my parents had fled Nazi and fascist-dominated Europe. We 
We both grew up hearing foreign accents at home. There was a touch of Mittel Europa in both our families. And we shared the experience of being observer kids in what was for our parents the nightmare years of McCarthyism. Our 33-year friendship spanned a tumultuous, a tumultuous period from the Reagan years to post-9-11 anxiety to the optimism ushered in by Obama. We could sit for hours and talk about everything, about the impact of what the French called capitalism sauvage, about terrorism, and the implications of globalism. I remember the fall of 1981 when Margot and John came to Rome to visit us. We were glued to our TV set watching as tens of thousands of East Germans and Hungarians were talking with their feet and demanding freedom. And a few weeks later, the Berlin Wall fell and communism was crumbling across the continent. We also shared moments of sadness and of joy. Margo was with me in Rome when my dog Truffle died and her enormous warmth and sensitivity helped me get through a very difficult period. Piero and I attended the marvelous, magical Adler Gleitman wedding on Martha's Vineyard with its echoes of a Midsummer Night's Dream. And we were in New York celebrating with Margo and John the birth of Alexander. We also had lots of adventures together. And it was on one of those adventures that I got to know Margo, the priestess, and her passion for paganism. And it was contagious. Mm. One year, the four of us piled into our car and traveled from Rome to Greece. It was not just a vacation, but a sort of spiritual pilgrimage. And as Margo guided us into the magical world of antiquity and the pantheon of restless gods and goddesses, her knowledge was infinite. We visited the old temples and sanctuaries. I learned from her about the mysteries of the Dionysian cults at Eleusis and stood in awe of the tomb of Agamemnon in Mycenae. We meditated in the cradle of democracy on the Acropolis, and I joined her in a ritual to the goddess Hera, a mystical experience that I will always treasure. The culmination of our trip was in Delphi, once considered the center of the world. And it's there that we joined Margo and fully embraced the pagan world. We hurriedly emptied our plastic little water bottles and nearly dived into the Castalian Spring as we filled our containers with the waters once dedicated to the god Apollo and the Muses. In antiquity, the spring was known for the power to induce creativity and poetic inspiration. It was once even a synonym for wisdom. I remember as we merrily guzzled the waters in the shadow of Mount Parnassus, Margo helped us feel right at home in the sanctuary of poetry, music, and learning. Her luggage filled with inspirational waters and plastic bottles, Margo returned home, and only occasionally, when in desperate need, with the dreaded deadline looming, she would delicately sip from her precious liquid <laughs> supply. She often joked about what she called her professional secret. <laughs> Greece was not our only pain. Pilgrimage we visited Etruscan tombs in Tarquinia and the ancient temple of the Sybarites at Pestum. And just two years ago, I took Margo by boat around the island of Gio, where we snorkeled in hopes of getting a glimpse of an ancient Roman ship that had sunk there centuries ago. I know Margo was a lifelong, no-nonsense New Yorker and a tireless and persevering reporter. But I also got to know Margo, the spiritual guy, who opened up for me a fascinating world of mysticism. And I often imagine her now, cavorting through the Elysian fields and singing, writing poetry, and having a hearty laugh. Mm. I just, it would be me and Margaret if I didn't say something in my own words. I would like to just say, the way I feel about Margot is that you all put your hands on your heart and imagine that Margot's hand is through with you and you're looking into her eyes. And then whatever you feel, for many decades, although we lived on opposite sides of the country and to my deep regret, had far too little time to spend together. But she was an inspiration, a colleague and an ally, at times a challenger, at other times a refuge for me and I miss her dreadfully. We both wrote books in the early days of the Goddess Revival that came out on the same day of the same year, October 31st, 1979. Drawing down the moon was a huge 
hugely influential because Margot had done her research. The interviews and the documentation of Roy Pagan revival at a stage when it was still, in reality, very small. But she held up a mirror and let us see ourselves as the nucleus of what would become a larger movement, one that might have an important impact on the world. Margot never sugarcoated her research. She looked at the world through her journalist's eye, through facts and documentation, and through the intellectual, sophisticated New Yorker's slightly cynical lens. When it came to New Age mysticism or wild flights of pagan fancy, she was no true believer. Always witty, never witless, Margot nonetheless was a very spiritual person. And while as a writer she was fearless, honest, and self-revealing, I believe that her own deep sense of connection to God was ultimately very private and personal. It manifested in her unbounded love of life, of singing, chanting, and dancing, and exploring every aspect of the many stories she investigated for ER, for EPR.
We close with these words. This is a richer universe than any of us know or dare to dream. Throughout countless eons, the stars have rolled on in beautiful and undiminished speed, lighting we know not what other worlds. Here on Earth, the seasons have revolved for centuries of centuries, and Earth too has known its ice ages. Yet seeds have not failed. Life has survived richer for all that is past, and winter ever yields to spring her priceless wealth of herb and flower. Loveliest of all Earth's flowers is the undying spirit of humanity. It may be that beyond the visible world there lies a still vaster, unseen world. Before the sublime mystery of life and spirit, the mystery of infinite space, of endless time, this universe of light and stars and mind, we stand in reverent, if unknowing, awe. This much we do know. We are at least one phase of the immortality of life life's longing for itself. Like flowers on the river's edge, we bud and bloom, unfold our season of usefulness and beauty, and then scatter our treasures to the wind and bequeath our promise to the future. Meanwhile, the mighty stream of life flows on, flows on to infinite new beginnings, rich and increasing of beauty and joy and love. And in this mighty stream, we too flow, not lost, but each of us somehow, some way, somewhere, eternally significant. Mm. For this I know, the Spirit never does betray the one who trusts it. In this mysterious, this infinite universe, nothing beautiful or worthwhile is ever finally impossible. So, here we are. The miracle of thought we cannot fully understand. The mystery of life and death we cannot fully comprehend. This chaos, this cosmos, has never been explained. The secret of the future has never yet been told. We love, we wait, we serve, we hope, we fail, we cover, Wait, hope, and love a little more. The more we love, the more we risk to lose and stand to fear. Upon the tenderest heart, the deepest shadow falls. Yet all paths, whether filled with thorns or flowers, or like both paths filled with both thorns and flowers, all paths end here. But character survives, goodness lives, and love, I swear it, is immortal. Oh,